don't read your own press. Stay humble, stay grounded, and realize that, you know, 90% of any of our success is because of the great people that we surround ourselves with. Um, and also, I, that is very uh, ego-boosting, though, um, when I live in a house with uh, three uh, teenage daughters who uh, is very uh, ego-not-boosting. So uh, I appreciate that. I can go home and really kind of re-embrace uh, those teenagers when I get there. So I'm, I'm super excited to be here today. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about, as George mentioned, patient provider perceptions on therapeutic goals. Um, and some might think that this is a little bit like soft, right? But I would argue that this is probably some of the hardest stuff that we do as caregivers, surgeons, providers. So I want to start off by uh, thanking uh, Mary. Uh, Mary and I go way back. We were uh, residents together uh, at that school up north. Um, and, um, you know, Mary has been um, a real leader since the days of residency, and I can remember looking up to her as a, a junior uh, resident, so I'm uh, not surprised at all at the trajectory of Dr. Hahn in American uh, surgery, and you um, all are extremely lucky to have her here um, as a, a chair of surgery. I, I would have uh, just one piece of advice for uh, Dr. Hahn is that um, she is uh, uh, cheering for the wrong team, and I suspect... Um, <laughs> After Thanksgiving this year, she will um, be met with more disappointment as the Buckeyes once again uh, crush that team up north. The other person I want to recognize is uh, Dr. Pulsides. Um, as George mentioned, um, he was our uh, HPB fellow uh, at Hopkins, and I just have some uh, great memories of working with George, um, really incredibly intelligent individual, um, a great surgeon, and a caring, uh, caring person. So I want to just uh, recognize George. The other people I would like to recognize is obviously the Ignatius family. I had a wonderful dinner last night with Paul and Sherry and the entire family, and I really enjoyed uh, the conversations uh, with you and hearing about uh, Joe and the uh, legacy um, that he uh, left and the incredibly rich life that he led. I mean, just amazing um, all of the different things that he accomplished, both inside of medicine, outside of medicine, um, in sports, um, in the Navy. Um, and one thing in, in looking at um, his memorial that really uh, spoke to me was this, um, this quote that I saw um, around one of uh, Joe's uh, uh, idols, uh, Sir uh, Wisdom uh, Osler. You know, the practice of medicine affords scope for the exercise of the best faculties of the mind and the heart. And so when trying to identify a topic uh, today to talk to you about, rather than kind of droning on about some very specific um, disease entity, I thought I would talk about something that was broader in scope, you know, patient and um, provider, and in particular around expectations. And this is something that if someone does pancreatic cancer and liver cancer and other things that have a grim prognosis is something that I struggle with as I kind of get on in my career. And this notion of what are patients' expectations when they come in to see us and what are our expectations about what we think we can deliver for patients. Now, my talk will largely focus on cancer, oncology, you know, pancreas, but this can apply to many different diseases. And I've given this talk to pediatric surgeons and bariatric surgeons, but what are the expectations when someone comes in with a BMI of 50, right, and you're doing a gastric bypass, right? What are the expectations of parents when someone has, you know, neck um, and you're taking them to the operating room or, you know, they have a big congenital diaphragmatic hernia or whatever it is. You know, people have this notion of that we are going to fix it and that they're going to get back to some type of state of normality. And where do their expectations lie relative to where our expectations lie? Because that dramatically impacts how people make decisions about what type of risk they will tolerate uh, when accepting different types of therapies. And also, as I'll show, it affects what type of risk we as providers will accept, you know, in doing some of these big cases, like resecting the cave or putting someone on bypass and extracting tumor from the atrium. We just had this case at Ohio State that we're talking about the other day about a young woman with a large ACC and tumor into the atrium and whether we should do the case or not. So like most things, it starts with a story. So this is a story of a patient that I saw at Hopkins about uh, eight years ago. A young gentleman, 45-year-old, has a squamous, tonsil squamous cell carcinoma, uh, had bilateral tonsillectomy, T2, close margins, got adjuvant radiotherapy. So, you know, for the trainees in the audience, you know, 
Squamous cell carcinoma, not the best prognosis, especially when it's stage four. This gentleman had a scan and he was noted to have this lesion that you can see right here. You know, it's in the white liver. It's um, you know, close to the portal pedicle. Um, it's clearly resectable, right? But it's stage four squamous cell carcinoma, very short disease-free interval. You know, should this patient be op offered an operation or not? He came to you know, see me with his wife. They had two young children and um, you know, they were um, you know, in my office. So we had a long conversation. And, you know, I, I think I'm a pretty good guy. You know, I, I spent probably like 45 minutes to an hour talking to both of them, saying, you know, this is a tough case. Technically, it's possible. I'm concerned about the biology. I'm concerned that this could be the first <clears throat> snowflake um, in, a, um, in a storm of further metastatic disease that we're not appreciating right now. We need to weigh the relative risks and benefits of an operation. And one of the risks of the operation is that you will have recurrent disease in a very short time period, and you may have gone through an operation that provided you no therapeutic benefit. <clears throat> so after that conversation, I, you know, I felt pretty good about myself. <clears throat> I was like, oh, okay, I handled that well, had a good conversation. I give all my patients my cell phone number so they can call me. I just find it's easier, right? If you have a question, just call me directly, and it just uh, takes anxiety on the way. The one downside is uh, this morning with the time change, someone did text me, one of my patients actually did text me this morning at 3 a.m. asking um, about um, some medical oncology issue. But anyways, after this case, what happened was that the wife actually wrote a formal letter of complaint uh, to the Department of Surgery and actually texted me a very lengthy complaint about me. And in essence, what she said was that she did not come to Johns Hopkins. She did not come to Tim Pollock to hear about snowflakes or prognosis or, you know, balancing the risks and benefits. She came to Johns Hopkins to see me because her husband's 45, they have two young kids. She wants to hear that I'm going to make it better. She wants to hear that I'm going to make it better. I can kind of see her perspective a little bit, yet it left me um, very kind of distraught, and it made me really start thinking about this whole idea of cure, right? And the C word used to be cancer, I think. Now, for me, the C word is cure. Yeah, the C word is cure. Talking to patients about cure, and if you kind of put that out there, that is a very powerful word. So based on that experience, you know, we started to think about this and try to organize some of our uh, research efforts around it. And part of, I think, the challenge is that if you look in media, common media, we are inundated with this promise of cure, right? The kind of the nuances of oncology and cancer care, prolonging people's lives, maybe, you know, curing some things like GIST but not being able to cure other things is lost, right? People think of cancer as a monolithic entity and that someone is going to find the cure, right? And in the current type of society that we have, right, where people want immediate gratification on Twitter or Snapchat or whatever, you know, people kind of want this type of, you know, satisfaction in the clinical setting and they want us to cure them. But this whole idea of cure in my mind is very um, undefined. And, you know, in surgery I think it's particularly relevant because, you know, in, we always hold surgery out as the best chance from cure. You know, I'm totally guilty of all the papers I've written, right? How many paragraphs have I started, papers have I started saying that, you know, surgery represents the best chance at cure. So as surgeons, even more sometimes than other disciplines, we hold out the patients that if you only have this operation, you know, there's a chance uh, at, at cure. Um, and this is very problematic because we don't have very good data, right? Most of the data in surgery is all retrospective, it's all case series. You know, we define cure as five-year survival. Well, let me tell you, you know, Mrs. Jones or, you know, Mr. Smith ain't thinking about cure as five-year survival. They are thinking about cure as I'm going to be alive to, like Paul, 99, right, or 100 or longer, right? That's what they're thinking about cure. And also the data that we have is massively subject to lead time bias and selection bias. So it's hard to extrapolate surgical data on outcomes relative to survival, even disease-free survival, and talk to patients about it, right? Because it's already been highly selected as lead time bias. And how also do you extrapolate population-based level data to the individual in front of you, right? I don't say this to patients, 
but I'd kind of say it in a nicer way, at five years, you're not 50% alive or 50% dead, right? You're either alive or dead, right? So what is like 50% chance of survival? And how do patients even assess like odds and risk? If you say you have a one in two chance or there's a 50% chance, you know, all these things, the way we frame conversations and frame our language very subtly can impact how patients think about what therapies they want and what risk they will um, accept. So, you know, I think this is the perfect example. You know, I, obviously I do a, a lot of liver surgery called a rectal metastasis. And when I was a medical student, um, you know, I'm a little bit older than I look, you know, we get pimped all the time. Like, what's the five-year survival for patients with colorectal liver metastasis? It was 25%, right? It was 25%, maybe 30%. And in our field, we have, you know, been patting ourselves on the back rightly so, maybe not completely, that we've doubled five-year survival, you know, with kind of modern-day chemotherapy, full box, full fury, bevacizumab, tuximab, five-year survival of colorectal liver metastasis, 50 to 60 percent. So it's amazing. What we don't talk about as frequently is that at five years, even though 60 percent of patients are alive, two-thirds are alive with disease. So we have not cured these patients. We're turning it into a chronic disease but it's not cure, right? Um, and also, if you look at data from uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering and others, um, the true 10-year survival is still only in the range of about 10 to 15 percent. So I think these data kind of belie, you know, some of the dangers of looking just at overall survival, just at looking at five years, not looking at disease recurrence. And here you again can see uh, these are data that we published um, showing that, you know, um, overall uh, survival um, is about 50 percent, but recurrence-free survival um, is significantly lower, only in the range of about 25 uh, to 30 uh, percent. The other problem we're looking at data, um, kind of being not too much of a statistical uh, wonk, is that, you know, we look at these methods and it's very challenging to use like Kaplan-Meier, right, or even like a Cox model. Because what you're doing is you're mixing people who were cured or are alive with people who aren't cured. And then you're coming, kind of coming up with like an average, right? And again, this isn't very, very helpful to patients. So what our colleagues in medical oncology have been using are more of these uh, things called cure models that try to account for the heterogeneity between the patient's uh, groups. And we've um, been using some of these statistical approaches and one disease that I'm particularly interested in is intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, which is a horrible disease. If intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma is kind of like pancreatic cancer, you know, five-year survival is in a range of about 30%. And then data from our group, I think this is about 1,000 patients that we looked at. The overall probability of cure 10 years after curative intent resection is only 10%. Is only 10%. Um, I don't talk about that in my clinic with patients, typically, who have intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma that I'm offering, a right hemihepatectomy to, or a right triseg. But these are what the data would bear out. And if you separate out um, those patients who are, quote, cured versus uncured, then you can estimate um, pa patients' uh, outcomes uh, more closely. The other thing that is interesting, and this is an online calculator that we publish, is this notion of when is someone cured? So, you know, there's this concept of, you know, what are the odds that you're cured, right? What is the kind of cure probability? So you may have, like, let's say a 25% chance of cure, but when would I feel 90% confident in saying, you're cured, do you know it's come back? You know, so there's also this idea of time, right? So I think all of us know, no one here, and there's breast surgeons in, in the audience, no one would follow a woman with breast cancer for five years anymore, right? We know. You gotta fall, you know, women much, much longer because these diseases can come back. Melanoma can come back, right? You know, I think now colorectal liver metastasis, I would never discharge someone after five years and say, hey, it's, you know, it's good. You're, you're cured, right? You know, there's a longer trajectory now and we need to be following patients longer and help them understand that, you know, your chance of being cured is also a time uh, dependent uh, uh, variable. So if you look at data um, from the American Cancer Society, you know, there's incredible heterogeneity with regards, obviously, to the diseases that we uh, deal with and then the probability that patients will be cured at one, five, or uh, ten years. So around, um, you know, the time that all of this was um, happening and I had this patient in my clinic and we started thinking about this, we came across a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine 
that specifically talked about perceptions of cures amongst uh, patients and providers and perhaps suggesting that there are some real differences um, around perceptions and understanding about goals of therapy and the potential um, to achieve cure and to have a therapeutic uh, benefit. And then the question becomes, why is that the case? You know, is that like bad communication? Like that, that Paul, he's just a horrible communicator and that's why patients are kind of getting it. Or is it like, wow, Paul's a great communicator, but patients just hear what they want to hear, right? So it's hard to know what's going on. And there's also uh, this need to balance, you know, accurate probability data, while also being able to communicate with uh, patients and maintain a, you know, a therapeutic relationship and not just kind of quote unquote, like lower the boom, right? And kind of just drop all this probability uh, data on patients and make it seem like it is hopeless. So this is the paper that we came across in New England Journal of Medicine. And I think this is a really interesting study. It's Deb Schrags out of Harvard. And they had a prospective data. And like most kind of impactful things, I think, it's very simple, it's very elegant. All they asked is they had patients who had incurable colon cancer, incurable lung cancer, clearly incurable, right? They're getting treated by uh, medical oncology with chemotherapy. And they just asked patients, hey, why are you getting chemotherapy? Why are you getting chemotherapy? 70% of the lung patients and 80% of the colorectal patients reported not understanding why they were getting chemotherapy. And actually, a large number of them said that the chemotherapy was very likely to cure them, which was just not true and wasn't the therapeutic goal of the medical um, oncologist. And even kind of a little bit more concerning is that there was this higher odds of incongruity between the provider and the patient amongst minority patients, and also paradoxically among those patients who rated their um, surgeon um, as a uh, great communicator, which we'll get back to. But here you can see here uh, graphically that you know 60 to 70% of uh, patients who had incurable lung or colon cancer said that the chemotherapy was either very likely or somewhat likely uh, to cure them and then this physician communicator score is that if you ranked your provider as a perfect communicator, 100%, you were two times more likely to think that you were going to be cured of your cancer. And I don't have time to show you the data today, but we have gone on and looked at this. And this actually tracks with um, your CG CAP scores, uh, patient satisfaction, patient's perception of your institution, so guess what? If I tell a patient or have a conversation that helps them think that they are going to be cured from their cancer, they love me. That Paul, a great communicator. Wow, man, best surgeon ever, quality scores off the chart, love Stanford, it's fantastic. If we have a conversation like the patient I showed you, it said, I don't know, this is a tough problem. I may be able to cure you, I may not. You know, it, this is going to be tough. I, Whew, you know, I want to help you, and then you get to kind of get into the muddy waters, right? Not always, but some patients will be like, this, you know, this, this is not the answer I wanted to hear. Um, this guy's a horrible communicator, uh, and Stanford's horrible, I'm going to MD Anderson, right? Um, so it's interesting about how sometimes we may be complicit in this as providers. And sometimes I think I see as surgeons, uh, you know, not to offend any medical oncologists in the room, but I see amongst our medical oncologists, sometimes, you know, I'll get a re referral from medical oncologists and, and the patient's like, oh, Dr. Smith says it's gonna be all okay. And, and this patient has like 12 lesions in their liver. And you know, Dr. Smith says, I'm gonna get chemotherapy. You're gonna take it all out. It's gonna be okay. And I'm like, well, let's talk about that, you know? And then even amongst providers, it can get very tricky about who's setting the expectations and are we all on the same uh, page. So after we read this article, um, you know, the best form of flattery is, um, you know, emulation. So we called up Deb Schrag and said, oh man, Deb, that was a great article. You know, you have all this prospective data. You did in medical oncology. We're, we're, we're surgeons. Can we have the data? You know, we're just gonna, you know, can we have the data? Can we look at this in surgery, right? It's an easy thing to do. And, you know, she's incredibly great. She said, sure, you know, have the data. So basically we looked at the same thing. We looked at patients who were um, getting surgery for lung and colorectal cancer. And we just asked them, what are the chances that you are gonna be cured from this operation? And not surprisingly, it was even higher, right? Because if you're pushing more chips at the center of the table, so to speak, right, you're gonna have an operation you know, it's a little bit more, I would argue, more of a commitment and it's a little bit more risk, right? 
you're expecting that that operation is, is going to deliver, right? Mm -hmm. That, you know, 80 to 90 percent of the times this is going to cure your cancer. So expectations are high when patients come to see surgeons. And again, we've had this data even with bariatrics, you know, what BMI they think they're going to attain or, you know, you name it. You know, it just doesn't go on in cancer. And even in stage four diseases, you know, 60 to 80 percent of the time, patients think that the surgery will directly uh, result in cure of their uh, cancer. And again, no surprise, you know, minority patients and patients who thought their surgeons were great communicators, you know, were more likely to think that um, the uh, surgery was going to cure their cancer. So that's interesting. So then we said, well, okay, okay, let's think about this. You know, what's going on, right? You know, what are, you know, surgeons' attitudes towards cure? Are surgeons, you know, talking about cure with their patients and what's their practice? Because maybe patient thinks they're going to be cured because surgeons, that's all they talk about right, in the preoperative visit, right? They put that out there. So we um, conducted a nationwide a survey to ask surgeons about their attitudes and practices around discussing a surgical cure. And you can see here, um, you know, the, you know, most people were uh, academic, most surgeons were academics, and there was a kind of potpourri of um, different uh, specialties within surgical oncology. And we just have some basic questions, you know, how often do patients specifically ask about cancer cure? And, you know, I think if there's one thing I leave you today is this whole idea about the word cure, at least in cancer, you know, when it gets brought up, at least for me, it, it, it's a hard stop. You know, we, we, need a, we need to really kind of start talking about this. So, you know, here we show that m many times patients actually do bring up the word cure, right? Most of the time or always, 50%, 50% of the time. And then we ask surgeons, you know, how often do you specifically use that word cure, specifically when you're discussing benefits of surgery? And it was about, you know, 40% of the time that they use the word cure. Now, when I give this talk to a lay audience, I tell patients, if someone brings up the word cure, the very next question that you should have is, um, what do you mean by cure? What do you mean by cure? Can we talk about that? Um, and so then we ask surgeons, how often do you ever discuss your definition of cure? Right, so I can say, you know, Mrs. Jones, you know, I think I could potentially cure you. Let me, let me help you understand what, what cure means to me, right? But most of the time we don't. We don't discuss with patients what we mean about cure. But interestingly, we, um, at least in a survey, you know, 70% of the time we throw around probabilities. Surgeons love probabilities. Patients love probabilities. Probabilities are ridiculous, right? We are basing, we have no good data to base a lot of these probabilities. People ask, what are the chance I'm going to be alive, right? What's the chance you're going to cure me? Oh, it's 30 percent, 40 percent. I mean, you could, we've done this, right? You can ask five different surgeons, and I'll show you because we did this. It's all over the map, but we throw around numbers, and patients anchor to the number, right? They anchor to the number, and then they love that because how many patients come back and say, my doctor said I was going to be alive for six months. Here I am a year later. That guy's an idiot, right? Um, or, you know, my doctor said that I had a 5% chance of survival. You know, I had this, I've, you said I had an 80% chance of survival. Here I am, I have recurrent disease, right? So we use a lot of probabilities, and I do not use numbers. I, 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 patients will try to corner me, and I, I don't do it. I don't give a number. And then we have a conversation about why I don't use numbers, and it's, I say it's much more nuanced. Let's discuss, you know, the kind of the, the possibilities, but I, I'm reluctant to give you a number. Or if I give a number, we talk about what that means to them versus like the whole population, things like that. So again, getting back to this definition of cure, if you ask like surgeons, what do you mean by cure? But, you know, perhaps you're not surprised, it's all over the map, right? Like a third um, of surgeons said that the patient will not experience recurrence of cancer any time in their lifetime. <clears throat> but a third will say, no cancer within five years. <clears throat> very different. That's, I think that's very different. And about 10 to 15 percent said that they'll have um, no recurrence um, within 10 years. To me personally, what cure means <clears throat> is that patients enter, re-enter the, ge the, the general risk of the general population. That, to me, and I'm not saying that's right, but that, that's what it means to, to me, right? You're, you're the same as anyone else who never had this cancer. But it's, it's, it's not what we're thinking in our head. And that's what maybe the patient might be thinking, but that's not what I'm thinking. So we need to be aware of this and we need to talk to patients about this. 
So this is what I was talking about before, where we presented these stylized scenarios to surgeons and different types of cancer, like pancreatic cancer, two centimeter pancreatic cancer with a lymph node, you got thyroid cancer, you got breast cancer. And then we just said, hey, what's the chance of cure? You know, what's the chance of cure? And the slide rule and surgeons would estimate the uh, chance of cure. And what you can see is like, it's all over the map. I mean, look at, look at these confidence intervals, right? They're ginormous, right? So, you know, this is, you can, Find surgeons to say anything, right? And this is part, we'll get to this a little bit later, but part of like the doctor shopping, right? You, I mean, you can always find a surgeon to operate on you. If you look hard enough, right? Because there's always gonna be someone way up there. 80%, <laughs> you know, you know, let's do it. But then there's gonna be someone down here that says, oh no, you know, it's, it's fait complete. I'm not gonna operate. So <clears throat> that's why I think, you know, kind of focusing on um, probabilities, um, and it, it can be dangerous. And then also just realizing that, you know, we don't know. We don't know. You know, even experts. And I go to, you know, we go to conf national conferences, and I love it when you get, like, five national experts, and you ask what you think is a simple question, and then they argue and go to the map, right? And, and, and so there's so much uncertainty in what we do. And that gets back to this whole idea of uh, remaining uh, humble. The other thing that I think is important is that, you know, cure is clearly important, but there are other goals of care, right? And, and this is some of the stuff that, you know, I worked on with Rebecca when we were at Hopkins together. You know, patients want other things, right? They, they want to be cured, clearly, but they want prolongation of their life. Prolongation of your life is different than cure, right? So someone may come and say, you know, look, I, I, you have pancreas cancer, you know, this, that, and I say, well, look, you know, I don't know if I can cure this, but, you know, your daughter's getting married in two years. I think we can get you there, you know? And obviously the conversation's, you know, more appropriate. But, you know, there's different goals that people want to achieve in their life. So I may not be able, not be able to deliver on the cure, but I can deliver on the pain relief, and I can deliver on prolongation of your life to get you to some graduation or something else, right? And these things are important. And I think it's myopic of us as providers when we overly focus on cure. Right? And I think we do a disservice to our patients because, you know, life is more nuanced and complicated um, and I would argue rich um, and there's many other things. That being said, um, amongst surgeons, you know, we perceive that the number one goal that patients want is to be cured. Right? So that's some of the, the bias that we bring. Um, is that we think patients want to be cured, they want to be lived longer, and then these other things like achieve life goals or secondary options. So I think that just when we enter these relationships and conversations with patients, we just need to be um, aware. Um, so this is another study that we did, and this was kind of uh, interesting study, I thought, is that we went to the clinics, and um, you know, after patients had their preoperative uh, visit with their surgeon, immediately afterwards, we just took the patient to one room, we took the surgeon to another room, and we interviewed them. And we just asked like, questions like, you know, how likely do you think the surgery will uh, cure you? Um, what do you think your chances are that um, the surgery will cure your cancer? And then this one interesting question I think is like, compared to other people who have the exact same diagnosis, the exact same stage, you know, how likely do you think you are to be cured relative to them? And not surprisingly, what you see is that patients compared to providers or tend to overestimate the uh, benefit. So patients are saying more often that I'm likely to be cured, the surgery is likely to prolong my life, and then they um, uh, underestimate the risk. So surgeons more likely to say like, maybe gonna cure them, maybe gonna extend their life, you maybe help their symptoms, and yeah, we're definitely gonna have a complication. <laughs> it's a Whipple, we're gonna have a complication. But the patient's kind of thinking like, I'm having my Whipple, you know, it's gonna save me, you know, it's gonna prolong my life, I'm gonna be cured, and there's not gonna be any complications. And this is it is graphically on um, a bar graph. This is the patient, the, the question I think is really interesting. You know, compared to others with a similar diagnosis and stage, how likely do you think it is that your surgery will cure you? And when you ask patients that, they think that they are much more likely to be cured with the same disease, the same stage than other patients. And I consider this kind of, you know, hopefully not too irreverently, the lottery ticket phenomena, right? Everyone knows when you buy a ticket to the lottery, the odds are like one in a million or one in 500 million. Everyone thinks they're holding the winning ticket. Everyone thinks they're holding the winning ticket. So you hear this colloquially when patients say, I know pancreas cancer is a bad disease. I'm gonna be the one that beats it, 
right? I'm gonna be the one that beats it. And it's tricky because you want to cultivate that hope, right? And I tell patients, I want you to be the one that beats it. I'm gonna do everything in my power so you are the one that beats it. Yet we also need to kind of talk about what if that doesn't happen? What if that doesn't happen? Let's talk about some other expectations. We want that, we're gonna fight for that. Yet we also, we have, to, we have to talk a little bit about like what happens if that liver metastasis shows up in six months? You know, are you gonna be okay with this? So I think that's um, difficult to deal with. And it gets to this whole concept of regret. And I think this is a really powerful um, notion. And this is this, you know, this highly negative, situation-specific, disease-specific feeling that the outcome would have been better if I had just made a different decision. So in my world, the worst scenario is that I do a, a whipple on someone, um, and then three months later, they have a liver metastasis. They have recurrent disease. I did an operation that they didn't, that didn't help them. Maybe they had a complication, they had a PJ leak or whatever, and then they regret having the operation. You know, and you hear that some patients will be like, you know, I'm, I'm glad we did it anyways. You know, I, I really wanted to do it, and I'm glad we did it. Other patients say like, oh, I wish I never had that operation. This is a nightmare. I never would have done that if I had known. And it's very um, highly, um, negative, and I'll show you data that affects patients' quality of life. So then I, I feel depressed, seriously, and I'll talk about that about you know the caregiver and regret that we have as providers. I, I regret having done that operation. And really what's super important about trying to avoid decisional regret is um, how the decisions are made, how the decisions are made. And we don't have enough time, but we're looking at this a little bit more, is that not everyone likes to make decisions the same way, right? And it's not making decisions the way we think patients want them made. It's basically making decisions the way they actually want them made. And this is kind of my beef with shared decision making. And shared decision making sometimes I think is like some, again, like one way, I, like, I do shared decision making, you walk in the room and this is how I do shared decision making, right? But that's not the way it is. It's a, it's, it's a continuum. Some P patients want a very autonomous decision. They want to make the decision and they want me to be information, provide information. Other patients want to be very deferential. They want the provider to make a lot of, and if they want that and you don't do that, then you're going to have, you know, things not lining up. And this is um, like a spider graph showing, you know, how the decisions are made. And if they align with one another, there's much less decisional regret. If the way decisions are made do not align with one another, your risk of decisional regret will be much higher. And if patients have decisional regret, they're going to have anxiety, they're going to have depression, and um, they're going to have a worse quality of life. So then we've done an incredible disservice to our uh, patients because not only do they now have kind of medical issues, you know, now we have introduced uh, more mental health uh, stress on them in their uh, cancer uh, journey. The other thing is what about providers? What about regret as providers? And I kind of characterize this as, you know, the, the cowboy or cowgirl, no regret, let's go for it, right? And there was someone at Hopkins, and don't say who it is, you may know, he, he would always say, they're gonna die anyways. They're gonna die anyways, let's go do it. And you know, the guy had no regret. He, you know, if he was just like, we gotta do it. And then there's other people who are very cautious, a lot of regret, oh man, if, if they get like a wound infection, you know, you know the type, right? Oh, I regret doing that operation, it's a wound infection. So, <clears throat> you know, this is continuum that um, surgeons have, and it's not even, I would argue, a constant mindset. You know, it's something that changes, I think sometimes based on the M&M that week, right? Because, you know, if you, if I'm rolling, if I'm doing big liver resections, I'm whacking out the cave, things are going great, you know, no complication. Next patient walks into my office, big case, complicated case. What do I say? Let's do it, let's roll. If I've had a rough month and I've, you know, had like a couple weeks and, you know, Dr. Hans taking me behind the shed and an M&M, next patient walks in with like a, you know, a lesion uh, that invades or one, 180 or, you know, 270 on the portal vein, neoadjuvant, let's wait, let, you know, like that. <laughs> but, but patients don't realize, you know, that they think that we are making decisions completely on objective data, completely based on what the scan shows, but we're not. We're human beings as providers. We have a certain tolerance for risk as providers. We have a certain level of regret that we will tolerate, and that affects our decision. And that, again, goes into the doctor shopping, right? Because some people have more regret than others. So there's a study that we did looking at factors associated with decisional regret. And there's two types of regret. There's regret of omission, 
I regret that I didn't do it. Oh man, I should have done that. You know what I mean? Like, you know, that patient with the Stanford and CDs did the case. I should have done that case at Ohio State. Or regret of omission, right? Oh, commission. I should have never done that. I regret having done it. And this is another study that we did looking at intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. I'll just quickly t take you through it. Is it basically three different cases, three different scenarios? You know, case one, you know, basically a patient with a five centimeter tumor, it's single. Case two, small tumor, you know, single, no metastasis. If you look at those two cases and you present them to a bunch of surgeons, overwhelmingly, you know, 90 and 100 percent say, I will regret if I, no if I don't do this case. Oh, I would regret om omitting that. But then you get to this case where it's a little bit more tricky. Multinodule disease, largest tumors greater than five centimeters. Look at here, when you interview a bunch of surgeons, 50-50. 50 say I'll regret if I don't do it, 50% say I'll regret if I, if, if I do do it, you know. So it's interesting, right, it's much more subtle and subjective about what we bring to the table. And I mean, it's kind of, I think, a little bit eye-opening for patients to see this, that I could have the same exact clinical situation, but it's a coin toss, whether someone's gonna offer you an operation or not, based on you know, their perception of regret and their tolerance of regret. So this is a, a um, review article that we wrote in Annals of uh, Surgical uh, Oncology. I generally always say that I, I somewhat regret the uh, title, kind of sounds like Star Wars or something, A Singular Hope. Um, but um, this was a paper that kind of looked at how we discuss uh, cancer and talked about some key points around, you know, avoiding euphemisms, like we got it all, right, we got it all, it's going to be okay, um, you know, this idea that we're, we're able to treat your cancer, well, what does treat mean, um, you know, this is, a, this is going to be a big surgery, um, things like that, and really kind of working uh, more towards scripting. And um, one thing that we're doing at our institution is that we actually are randomizing our residents to a very formalized communication skill course um, to see if um, we can change some of their behaviors and also see, um, you know, if patients' perception of the conversation is different. One thing that is really important to me as part of this talk is that I am not trying to dash hope, right? I'm not saying that we shouldn't focus on cure. I'm not saying that we shouldn't you know, rally around our patients and give them hope. But I'm trying to say, though, is that we should reframe things, right? And again, this idea of thinking broader, not necessarily just focusing um, on um, hope alone, but really trying to engage our patients um, in a more broadly conceived patient-provider interaction. And again, this gets away from this idea of just one approach. Maybe we call it shared decision-making, or you put any title you want on it. But we want to get away from this idea of even communication. Even as a profession, we focus so much on communication. But communication is only part of it. I could be the best communicator in the world, yet it may not get me to where I need to be, right? Because I could be a great orator, I could this and that and the other thing. But it's really about this relational lens, how we form relationships with patients and their families and kind of assess multiple uh, perspectives and moving beyond this concept of just a dyad and looking at social structures and family structures, multifactorial relationships, um, assessing things like reciprocity, um, and um, again, getting to this notion of concordance or discordance and um, looking at social context. So um, more recently, some of the things that we've been trying to do is try to come up with specific things that we can do to activate uh, physicians um, how we can increase patient um, engagement uh, to really work on um, this um, idea of building relationships between patients and providers. And we've been doing a lot of this through mixed method approaches. I work with a clinical psychologist, um, and we've had a lot of focus groups, a lot of survey work. Um, and um, what we um, have done is, you know, we've kind of been publishing a little bit about re reciprocity, um, patient expectations, and this is, I think, a really ripe area um, for not only cancer, but uh, anything, and cardiac surgery is another big area where this comes up. You're putting an LVAD in somebody, oof, you know what I mean, and their expectation whether they're going to get a heart transplant or not. And um, what we are doing right now is that we have three specific interventions. One is a patient passport. <clears throat> this is a validated tool um, that was um, uh, you know, derived by um, National Association um, that kind of activates the patient, so it kind of takes them through every step of the way and kind of prompts them to be asking questions of their caregivers and providers. 
We're also doing things around um, specific communication um, training. And then one other thing um, that I'm going to share with you is just um, this idea of a spiritual toolbox because, hey, I did go to divinity school. And I kind of think that for some patients, and we have some empiric data, that about half of patients, they say that their spirituality or their religion is important to them. Um, and, you know, they want someone to at least bring it up or engage them about the topic. Surprisingly, at least to me, is they don't want it to be their doctor. You know, only about 10% say they want to be their doctor. They want to be other people, like the nurse, the chaplain, the imam, you know, um, the rabbi, but they want it to be brought up in the um, healthcare setting. And what we're doing right now is that we're uh, randomizing patients and doctors. Um, this is our plan um, to these three different interventions. And then the outcomes, we're specifically looking at um, things like shared decision-making, decisional regret, satisfaction with treatment, and quality of life, not only among the patients, but also among uh, the providers. And again, you know, these are some of the uh, uh, articles um, that recently AMA uh, published a whole journal focused on uh, spirituality. And this is uh, where we're kind of getting into this. And these are some of the papers that we recently published around the role of religion and spirituality around uh, cancer care. And this is um, a project um, that actually we got some funding for that actually develop an individualized spirituality program for oncology patients. So we've been doing a lot of work now around uh, focus group surveys, trying to understand what providers think their patients' needs are, um, and also helping providers become more self-aware. Again, I don't have time, but we've done some work that all of us bring who we are to the table. So if, if I am intrinsically religious or intrinsically spiritual, I approach situations differently than perhaps someone who's not. And sometimes that's okay, sometimes that's not okay. And patients, some patients like it, some patients don't. And that's okay. The point is, though, I just need to be aware of that. I need to own that, and I need to be able to step back from myself and say, what am I bringing to the table besides my skill as a liver or pancreas surgeon? You know, what, what color, rose color glasses am I wearing that I'm looking at this situation, you know, at that may be good and or a, a challenge to this specific patient uh, relationship? So um, that was a lot. Um, hopefully you found something um, in this talk that resonated with you. I know it was very uh, cancer specific, but I really do think this whole notion of concordance and discordance around therapeutic goals and also this notion of um, you know, building therapeutic relationships um, and using this relational lens uh, to interact with our patients and their family members is incredibly important as we um, ultimately want to treat individuals not as patients but as people. So, Mary, thanks again for the uh, opportunity, and uh, George, uh, great to see you, and Tom and all my other good friends in the Department of Surgery. It's really an honor. And once again, the Ignatius family, thank you so much, uh, Paul and Jerry, for this wonderful honor to, uh, to uh, um, honor Joe's uh, uh, memory in his name. So thank you.